Also, thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and the Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies. We're having a, a webinar today on the Russia-Ukraine war and the law, war crimes, legal accountability, and other campaigns on the legal front. And I'm joined today uh, by four panelists. I'm Ron Levy. I teach at the Monk School, as well as in the Department of Sociology. I'm also the Associate Director for Academics at the Monk School. And my own work has been on questions of how we respond through law, uh, often to issues of atrocity. And so I'm really happy today to be able to uh, bring these questions to light and also introduce four superb panelists, uh, some of whom are friends. And so I'm happy to also be able to do that and bring everyone together today. Uh, we'll be going in a slightly different order than you may have seen on the website. So I'll introduce everybody very briefly in turn, and then we'll begin. Uh, everyone will have about five, six, seven minutes, depending how long they want to go for. Uh, and then we'll do a kind of tour de table. And we'll also have uh, questions and Q&A from the audience that I'll be able to moderate. So if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A and I'll be able to pick them up there and ask them of our panelists. We'll begin uh, in a moment with Alex Whiting. Alex is a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He's former investigations coordinator at the International Criminal Court or the ICC in The Hague. Alex will be followed by Eugene Finkel, who is an associate professor at SIAS or the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins. After Eugene, we'll be turning to Monica Eppinger, who is Associate Professor and Co-Director of the Center for International and Comparative Law at, this, at St. Louis University. And then finally, we'll turn to uh, Mikola Inatovsky, who is a Professor of International Law in the Department at Kiev Shevchenko University, first Vice President of the Ukrainian Association of International Law, and now Judge to the European Court of Human Rights in respect of Ukraine. And so maybe let's just launch right in. Uh, Alex, maybe we'll turn to you. And as soon as you're done, just say, Ron, I'm done, and we'll turn to Eugene. Thanks, Ron. Uh, and thank you to the organizers um, and to my fellow panelists. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, I thought I would just take my initial five or six minutes to do two things. First, kind of set the table on the what criminal accountability might look like here. And secondly, raise uh, um, three things that I think are kind of striking and to take note of, and that could be the, the basis of, of later discussion. So in terms of setting the table, um, and I'm gonna be focusing on war crimes, crimes against humanity. So criminal accountability, where and how might that happen? Um, well, there are really three places that right now um, that could happen. One is in the courts of Ukraine. Um, the second is at the International Criminal Court. And the third is um, in the courts of third countries. Um, and it may be in terms of numbers, it may be a little bit in that order. Um, so the, the, the courts of Ukraine have already started prosecutions. They've had, they have a uh, an enormous number of investigations, and they have started a couple of actual prosecutions of Russian soldiers um, who are alleged to have been engaged in war crimes. Um, so they are very active on the ground. The International Criminal Court has jurisdiction beca because Ukraine, while not a state party of the International Criminal Court, um, granted jurisdiction to the court, um, and, and therefore the court um, started a very within days of the invasion started an investigation after then 39 now i think it's up to 42 43 countries referred the case to the court um, for investigation so they are very active um, and on the ground already investigating and then as i said there may be third countries now what are these in different investigations going to be thinking about as they start their investigations and prosecutions well, each one of these investigations, Ukraine, International Criminal Court, and third countries, are going to think about first what what level of perpetrator might be might they investigate. The International Criminal Court typically goes for more senior perpetrators, though I think in this case they'd be willing to charge more uh, start with some lower level, mid level, mid level commanders um, to begin with. Um, the second thing is what kinds of crimes. So. 
Um, the focus right now, I think, is mainly on war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, and we can get into discussion about what the differences are there. Um, there is some talk about uh, the crime of genocide, uh, and certainly investigators will be looking for evidence of, uh, uh, of whether uh, there is um, uh, per genocide perpetrators here. But I think right now the, the focus on war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, secondly, these investigations are going to think about how are they going to coordinate with, with one another, uh, because um, there's a lot of activity, but the thing you don't want to have is investigators colliding into each other, duplicating efforts, um, interviewing the same witnesses over and over again. I think this in the, sh in the short to medium term is one of the principal challenges of all these investigations is actually to coordinate all of the efforts and, and figure out who's going to do what, who's going to focus on what, and where is all the evidence going to go? Who's going to hold it? How is that going to be managed? That's a massive task. And then the third thing, of course, is how are the investigators, if they charge people, going to make arrests? Now, Ukraine has some people in custody, um, so those that there, they, those people can be prosecuted and brought to trial. Um, for the International Criminal Court, targeting more senior level people, that's a bigger challenge to get arrests, and that's something we can talk about. Here are the three things that strike me as um, particularly noteworthy in the criminal investigations. First of all, this is a very interesting kind of justice moment, uh, unlike any I've really seen um, in, in my career in this world. Um, there is just an enormous amount of interest, energy, commitment, dedication to investigating war crimes, crimes against humanity here. It is really transformative of the field. And you see some countries like the United States, for example, um, beginning to reconsider positions that it had about the International Criminal Court. So this could be a transformative moment, not just, you know, for for Ukraine in many, many ways, um, but also for the field uh, in general. The second thing is we're seeing all kinds, and this is a little bit related, we're seeing all sorts of new investigative possibilities using open source information, using intercepted information, um, you know, video, uh, th that kind of technology. Now, this isn't really new. Um, but it is really blossoming here and getting a lot of attention. And I think that those sorts of technologies also transformative for the field. And then the third thing that is really striking about what's going on right now is the, res the resurrection, the discussion about the crime of aggression, uh, which was the main crime at Nuremberg, um, is one of the crimes at the ICC, but doesn't apply for the ICC in this case for reasons we can get into. But there's now serious discussion about, um, about having a separate tribunal for the crime of aggression. And that is a dramatic uh, and important, uh, potentially important development in the field um, that we can get into uh, also in more detail. So there's my sort of setting the table, giving a little background, setting the table, of some of the issues that we may want to talk about. Back to you, Ron. Super. Thank you, Alex. And um, so it's really interesting that you talk about the field, uh, because, of course, in the field, there are professionals, there are politicians, uh, there are other interests at play. And so we start to get a sense that the legal questions, uh, though they happen within a particular professional field, are interconnected with other fields like diplomacy, uh, like forensic expertise. So hopefully we can come back around to those questions in our next round. Uh, Eugene, I'll turn over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this panel and being here. I will be brief because I'm here more to learn than, you know, to speak. I'm not, I am an odd man out on this panel. I'm not an international lawyer. I have absolutely zero legal education. I am a genocide. I'm a scholar of genocide. And I assume that I'm here because I had the audacity about a month plus ago to be like, not to be probably the first Western scholar of genocide to say it is a genocide. And that's what I, and that's what I'm going to talk about because since then we're having this discussion between lawyer, between international lawyers, scholars of international law. 
and historians of genocide and mass violence, social scientists, people like myself about what exactly do we mean, what exactly genocide is, and how do we make this determination, which I think it's pretty, is pretty important for our discussion today, especially as Alex mentioned, genocide is, is already discussed as a possible crime for which people uh, might be might be held, held legally accountable. And from what I see again, from the outside is different discussions going on in different, in different communities that eventually spill over to the public sphere and to the political sphere about, well, how, what exactly do we mean by those crimes? What kind of criteria we use and whether we should allow international law to dominate this discussion. I don't want to use the word colonize, but that's essentially what we are getting to and who gets the you know who gets the right to call some to call something a genocide because uh, it, because international lawyers are much more skeptical than historians in calling in calling it a genocide for several reasons one reasons that uh, one reason was most clearly identified by Philip Sands in his op-ed for the New York Times that the bar of for calling something a genocide is just impossibly high, so we better not even try. And to me, it just, I mean, I understand the logic, but, you know, looking at that, looking at that from my perspective as a genocide scholar, it makes, it makes little, it makes little sense. Now, I understand that, uh, that the people on this panel are thinking more about, about how to hold in individual perpetrators accountable for this crime rather than labeling an event as such. A genocide, but still I don't think that those kind of, uh, those kind of considerations should hold us back from, talk from talking about genocide. Sam's logic was that, you know, we should wait for the courts and what happens if the courts decide that it is not genocide, then all the Ukrainians and supporters of Ukraine will be, will be disappointed. But my problem with that is that it misses or it does not, it binds our hands when it comes to prevention and intervention. If we need to wait years until courts issue their determination, then no prevention and definitely not intervention are possible. So how long should we wait when we see something that by most scholars of the genocide who are not lawyers is considered a genocide? A genocide. So, so why should we be, why should we be bound by the thinking about future trials. And if we should, I'm not saying that we should not take those legal perspectives in consideration into account, then we don't have a mechanism to talk between lawyers and law lawyers about, about what is going on. Their separate discussions are going on and where they intersect either on Twitter or in different, you know, interviews where where journalists interview a scholar of genocide who say it is a genocide and an international lawyer who said we need to be more careful just to present an opposing views. And to me, it's not, it's not very fruitful, both for, for intellectual reasons, but also for practical reasons, because after all, we are driven by the same, you know, by the same desire to have account, to have accountability for what is going on in Ukraine. And secondly, and it relates to what Alex said earlier about, you know, new forms of evidence and new approaches to evidence closing up. I think that all those processes that of accountability that we're discussing, they should not be limited to lawyers or criminal investigators only. They should also include people from other disciplines who can bring you know, different perspectives like sociologists or political, or political scientists or historians. And we actually, have a pretty, we actually have a pretty decent Soviet template for that. The extraordinary commission that investigated the, the crimes of Nazi Germany, including in Ukraine, was such a template that included both legal scholars and filmmakers and journalists and people who did PR and social scientists precisely, precisely to bring this integrated approach. Because in my view, genocide, and again, I'm talking mostly about genocide rather than, you know, other types of crimes that, that will be that will be discussed here. Well, it's too big an issue to be left to lawyers, and I and I apologize if I offend any of the lawyers here. To determine that there is a genocide, we need a bigger picture, and we can't have it if we have only lawyers or criminal investigators using their methods only. So I think we need to. I think 
there needs to be a dialogue between between the law community and other and other communities starting mass violence. So I will stop here. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Eugene. And before I turn to uh, Monica, I'm just going to put a couple of ideas in the environment. Also, as people start to come up with questions for Q&A, maybe it helps. Uh, you know, I'm struck, Eugene, you mentioned Nuremberg. And my, um, in my teaching, at least, when I teach about Nuremberg, I put up a quote uh, where I, I believe it's students at Oxford, maybe at Cambridge, who say that uh, that, ge that the concept of genocide is too fancy an idea, and they weren't sure exactly what it could mean, right? And so we're stuck in this uh, situation, starting in the 40s, but continuing to now, of how, how to think about, um, I think, Eugene, you're pushing us to do so, uh, how to think about situations of mass violence, highly violent societies, some people call them, uh, outside of legal concepts, mm -hmm. but to also think about accountability uh, through legal concepts at once. And in a way that's uh, partly, I think, maybe the challenge that uh, this panel is uniquely suited to talk about. Uh, so Monica, I will turn over to you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to uh, repeat my thanks to um, the Petro Yachik program at University of Toronto and the Monk School for co-sponsoring with us. I'm the co-director of the Center for International and Comparative Law at St. Louis University, and I really appreciate this chance to think together. Um, my research focuses on Ukraine and uh, specifically Ukrainian political actors and institutions. So I'll speak a little bit about some international law doctrines, but as they have been employed by Ukrainian political actor, or legal actors and legal institutions. Um, not surprising to anyone who's been following the developments of the war, Ukrainian legal actors and legal thinkers have been very creative in their approaches. And so um, I wanna pick up on a question that Eugene just raised, um, who should be able to call something a genocide? And I want to add to something that Alex said when he talked about the different courts that have been involved so far, and that uh, the focus has been on war crimes and not on genocide. And there's one little asterisk that I'd like to add to this, which is really interesting. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to walk through a few, few steps. Step one, um, it's illegal for one state to launch a war of aggression against another state. You have to have a legal justification. Um, the government of Russia claimed that Ukrainians were, or that the government of Ukraine was committing genocide against Russians or Russian speakers or ethnic Russian populations. If you remember in the run up to the war in January and previously, actually for several years previously, the government of Russia alleged that Ukraine was committing genocide against Russians in Ukraine or ethnic Russians or people of Russian heritage or people who speak Russian, which is a large percentage, like more than 90% of the population of Ukraine is bilingual. So there's this alleged genocide uh, allegation by Russia against Ukraine. Flash forward, February 24th, the war starts. February 26th, uh, 9.30 p.m., Ukraine brings a case before the International Court of Justice and asks the International Court of Justice under the Convention Against Genocide. So why, um, why is the Ukraine going to the International Court of Justice? Let me intercede one more point here. Um, normally, if a state has launched a war of aggression against another state, you could go to the UN and ask for UN peacekeeping forces or ask the UN Security Council to take action. But Russia is a member of the, uh, one of the permanent five members of the UN Security Council. It has a veto. And so everyone knows that if you, you could bring such a move before the Security Council for political purposes, for visibility purposes, but you know in advance Russia is going to veto. So it's as if you're in a dead end with the UN taking any action. Ukraine uh, launches a case before the International Court of Justice and says under the Convention Against Genocide, international treaty law, uh, if there's a dispute between different states about the interpretation of the treaty, you can appeal to the International Court of Justice 
answering Eugene's question in legal terms, who gets to answer the question about what a genocide is? One answer is the International Court of Justice does according to the Convention Against Genocide. So it's almost as if Ukraine was bringing a genocide case against itself. Very, very clever. Ukraine goes to the International Court of Justice and says, Russia says that we've been committing genocide. That's one of their reasons for going to war against us. We have a dispute about the meaning of genocide. We appeal uh, with jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice, jurisdiction under the Convention Against Genocide, for the International Court of Justice to settle this matter. Was Ukraine, yes or no, committing genocide against Russians or Russian speakers or ethnic Russians in Ukraine? And as a provisional measure, we ask that until the court has reached its decision, again, getting to Eugene's point about how these court procedures can take years, until the court uh, comes to a final decision on this matter, we ask as a provisional measure, measure that the court um, uh, demand that Russia cease all aggression in Ukraine. Ukraine, uh, the, Ukraine launched this, it, it filed its brief two days after the war started. So again, very quick and very clever. Because under uh, the UN Charter, I think it's Article 94, every member of the United Nations is obliged to uh, fulfill or, or is compelled to uh, comply with any decision of the International Court of Justice. So if the International Court of Justice comes out in Ukraine's favor, then you've gotten around this block in the Security Council that normally mutes the UN and makes the UN um, toothless because of the Russian veto. And so uh, there were hearings uh, on these provisional measures in the middle of or early March. Um, Ukraine argued its case, Russia didn't show up. Uh, Russia sent a letter saying that it didn't think that the court even had jurisdiction to hear the case. Um, the court issued its opinion at the end of March, 13 to 2, in favor of Ukraine. And so right now, under the provisional uh, decision of the International Court of Justice, um, Russia is obliged to cease all aggression in Ukraine. Of course, it hasn't. And the question now, as Alex said, this is a really interesting justice moment in our field, the question now is, will the UN issue peacekeeping forces or some other interdiction in the war in Ukraine? Will it get involved in the war in Ukraine in a way that a NATO country couldn't without starting World War III on behalf of Ukraine to enforce the decision of the ICJ? That's an open question, but super interesting moves going on by, uh, by the Ukrainian side using almost uh, begging the question, asking, okay, you've accused us, us of genocide, I'm gonna accuse myself and go to court. And that will drag in all of these other institutions that otherwise Russia could block from getting involved. So that's one really interesting legal move by, uh, on the Ukrainian side. Another interesting legal move that's really important um, is the declaration of martial law. In Ukraine, um, one of our um, fellow panelists in absentia, so our friend Alexander Mareshko, who wanted to participate in this panel, is a member of the Parliament of Ukraine and is obliged by his parliamentary duties not to be with us today. But I contacted him when I heard the sirens going off. I, I was watching the live cam of Kiev on the morning of February 24th, Kiev time. I heard the sirens go off and I, I messaged Alexander and said, Alexander, I, heard, I just heard air raid sirens in Kiev. And he said, yes, I'm at the parliament. We're working. We're going to pass martial law. And they did pass martial law within the air raid sirens went off at five till seven. They had passed martial law before 730. I think it happened at about seven in the morning. So again, very quick. And this is this famous uh, law that bars uh, men of U Ukraine of fighting age between the ages of 18 and 60, it prohibits men from leaving the country. It has meant that the refugee crisis of Ukrainians fleeing the war has been largely a matter of women and children. Um, it has wrenched families apart. Um, under the auspices of the martial law, I know I am obviously, um, I, I have, I am not neutral in this conflict. <laughs> I am definitely on the Ukrainian side, but I want us to be very clear about um, 
about some nuances and to be very clear about some of the difficult decisions that are being made and to be thinking about Ukraine's democratic future when Ukraine wins the war. Under the auspices of, inter of this martial law, um, two things have happened that I just wanted to bring people's attention to. President Zelensky issued a presidential de decree banning 11 political parties that were in, in opposition on the basis that they were pro-Russian. And that may be, and they may even be saboteurs. I'm not saying that it's not justified by national security. That's a matter of fact that needs to be investigated by people other than me. Um, but I want to bring to our attention that political parties have been banned under this martial law. Another thing that has happened under the auspices of martial law is that President Zelensky or issued an order combining the three national television um, channels into one platform in order to implement a decision from Ukraine's um, National Security and Defense Council um, on creating a unified information space. So there has been a, a nationalization of some of the information space in Ukraine under the auspices of, of martial law and a banning of political parties. These may be necessary and warranted moves. I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying, let's keep the eye on the ball because a lot of things, as I have found in my own country, in the name of national security, a lot of things can happen that may not be to the, uh, to the long-term best benefit. Once we get out of the emergency situation, it may not be to the long-term best benefit of Ukraine's democratic development. And I say that as American, because I know that that's happened in my country. All right, I've, I yield the floor. Thank you, Monica. Before we turn to Nicola, I just wanted to um, bring two things together also as questions start to come in. I think Eugene, if I can paraphrase him, was pushing us to think about concepts in plural ways, right? Uh, or at least to think of the pluralism of ideas and ways of thinking and ways of knowing about what was happening on the ground. And um, Monica, I think your, at least for me, your comments really drive home the fact that law is itself also plural. And so we can think about, and I think it's important to put out for the audience, a, just a bit of definition, which I'll do. Um, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, thinks about law as individual responsibility of individual actors and individual criminal responsibility at that. And so we talk about who, and Alex was asking who, <laughs> might be in the dock at an ICC prosecution, low level, high level. Uh, the International Court of Justice, Monica, that you mentioned, uh, some people might know it, of it as the world court, uh, is a place where states are the parties and not individuals. States sue states, states bring questions of law to the International Court of Justice. And so in that sense, it's, uh, its frame of reference is at the level of the state rather than at the level of the individual actor. And Alex seems uh, to think that there's more nuance here that I should be pointing to, I think, uh, but we can, we can talk about that. But that's already some plurality there. Uh, and so the International Court of Justice may find something to be genocide and the International Criminal Court may not convict someone of genocide. And these things can happen in parallel. At the same time, those are happening at the international level. Monica, I think you're pressing us to also think of the domestic level, uh, where there'll be domestic laws, some might be civil, some might be martial, right? And so in that sense, there's pluralism there too. Uh, and then Alex, uh, in his early comments, uh, invoked the idea that third countries, third party countries, may find themselves getting involved uh, through generally criminal prosecution uh, in something we think of as universal jurisdiction, right? Could Canada? prosecute? Uh, could Belgium prosecute? Could the Germans prosecute? So we can talk about uh, these possibilities uh, in Q&A or later on. But Mikola, I'm going to give you the, um, not the last word, but the last first word of this panel. Yes, thank you very much, Ron, and um, um, uh, thank you very much to the University of Toronto and, and to, to the uh, wonderful co-panelists for organizing the discussion, for participating in it. Um, it is, has been a great pleasure already listening to everyone's initial comments, and I would like to pick it up from where Euron left it, uh, namely the um, the two levels of uh, of the legal dimension of this of this conflict, the interstate level, the level of state responsibility, and the level of individual responsibility. And this is exactly what what uh, uh, has been mentioned by 
both Alex and, and, and Monica. And uh, um, I, uh, I tend to agree completely with Eugene that uh, uh, the uh, phenomena we're dealing with here, um, uh, they are in, extremely multidimensional and uh, uh, the purely legalistic view uh, would, would always be a distorted view. And uh, the, uh, the policies that Russia has been implementing over many years against uh, Ukraine, uh, against Ukraine as, as a sovereign nation, they um, uh, have to be assessed from uh, various uh, standpoints. And, and of course, the concept of genocide is one of uh, those which absolutely has to be invoked and has to be analyzed, but it is by far not the only concept that uh, is, is, is at stake here. So uh, there's, there's plenty of things to discuss, but let me uh, say that uh, essentially international law um, uh, is perhaps uh, um, undergoing through a very interesting moment because everything that it has elaborated over uh, many uh, centuries of its development and uh, particularly the um, uh, institutions and mechanisms that um, uh, were created after the end of the Second World War are now being tested, being tested rather severely by the uh, war of aggression in Europe, um, which uh, is indeed in the European continent unprecedented since the Second World War. So essentially um, after Hitler, uh, uh, not a single state uh, uh, leader in, uh, in Europe um, uh, carried out a policy on a, a war of aggression uh, basically uh, aimed at uh, destroying another sovereign state, at capturing its territories, uh, at, at denying uh, the, the people of their right um, to um, uh, self-determination, of uh, uh, denying the uh, neighboring country of uh, its rights as, 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 a, sovereign, as a sovereign state. Um, so uh, everything that international law has to offer is actually um, a test here, and uh, uh, this is what's, uh, what we are seeing now uh, from Ukraine, but also from international lawyers uh, coming from different countries, uh, is essentially the attempts to um, uh, make use of uh, various uh, options that exist. And again, there's two major levels. There's the traditional level of uh, state responsibility that has always been there um, well before the Second World War, which was enhanced uh, after the Second World War with multilateral uh, forms, with uh, a multilateral system of collective security within the United Nations based on uh, the UN Charter and the um, uh, rights and competencies of the uh, Security Council of the United uh, Nations under Chapter 7. Um, and essentially what we see at that level is that there's not much um, that um, can be can be done helpfully with uh, with the with the United with with the Security Council, and with with Chapter Seven, uh, whereas the more traditional mechanisms of international law, the more traditional ways of uh, uh, dealing with state responsibilities, such as uh, self defense, which is broadly um, self help. Other ways of self-help, such as introducing uh, individual and collective countermeasures and sanctions against the, the state which um, uh, is violating international law, uh, they, they appear to be more, more useful. Of course, there's, there's many uh, novel concepts that are being engaged here. For example, the uh, right of every state to introduce um, countermeasures and, and, and these sanctions against the Russian Federation uh, for violations of international law against Ukraine, against a third state. Is, this is pretty much based on the concept of erga omnes obligations, which uh, the concept which has been developed only in the second half of the 20th um, century. But the, the, the collective machinery is unfortunately failing seriously. Um, however, um, when it comes to individual criminal responsibility, and this is what Alex has set out so, so well, and I don't have to repeat what he has uh, already said at this stage, this is absolutely uh, enough, I think. This is something that uh, can potentially be developed even further um, uh, because the war, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, the, the, the atrocities that uh, uh, have been committed and are being committed uh, in the context of, of, of that war, um, uh, they give a chance, for example, to the International Criminal Court to finally prove that uh, it can be relevant and it can be an efficient institution. But also, uh, when it comes to the crime of aggression, the, uh, uh, the situation when international law has all the required substantive 
um, uh, provisions, substantive norms, but lacks uh, efficient machinery to enforce um, the responsibility, the individual responsibility of state leadership for the crime of aggression, that this situation might change if the project of creating a special tribunal uh, for the crime of aggression against Ukraine uh, succeeds. And, 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 I, and I hope that there are more and more, well, I believe that there's, there's more and more um, uh, reasons to believe that the project will be successful in one form or, or, or another. So this uh, altogether provides us with uh, uh, the uh, with the sort of field of discussion and international lawyers, uh, but also other uh, specialists from other disciplines with uh, uh, material for uh, practical work that can make difference today um, in practice, but also uh, things that uh, will have to be studied and will have to be reflected on for many years um, uh, to come. And these are extremely rich opportunities, unfortunately, again, uh, that such a sad and even tragic situation uh, gives us uh, such, such possibilities. But this is how things are in, in life. This is how things are in international law. International law always uh, is always pushed forward um, uh, due to rather tragic events in the world's history. Let's hope that this war will not uh, uh, be even broader in, in scope than it is uh, now, and that the international community uh, together will find the responses uh, to this war, in particular uh, through international law, because international law is certainly something that provides a, um, a solid basis for good solutions. So let me stop here, and I'm very uh, much looking forward to uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mikola. Um, I see questions are already coming in, so I, I don't want to, you know, I arrogate to ourselves too much of this um, before we turn to the to the audience. And at the same time, I, I don't know that I can uh, personally stop myself. So I, I just want to put um, this. You know, Mikola has raised the question of uh, how this is how terrible circumstances lead to opportunities uh, uh, for international law in this case, but Eugene reminds us also for social science and historians uh, to think through their concepts and to refine uh, how they do things. And I guess I want to put two parallel things that I see going on on the table and maybe then we can turn to, um, maybe some people can answer and then we can turn to some Q and A. Uh, the first in a way for Eugene, but for everybody is, um, Eugene, you said something in your comments that was that international lawyers, in the current moment at least, appear more hesitant to refer to this as a genocide than do historians of genocide or social scientists of genocide. And maybe I'm wrong, but that strikes me as a role reversal, um, right? So that in the early years of genocide studies, let's say, um, the kind of barometer of genocide was influenced by uh, the Shoah and then uh, and the question about exceptionalism would arise. Um, and, and comparative genocide studies then emerges as a field and it becomes then a way to think through things. Law in having a definition of genocide at some level, one can say, was always willing uh, to entertain the idea that there would be different scales and types of genocide. So I guess I'd like to think through Eugene on one end, the kind of opportunity and importance for social science and history uh, to think through the concepts and make them their own concepts instead of being uh, tied to the legal, um, well, instead of having a concept that's tied to law so much that they can't define it by themselves, right? So gaining some autonomy and purchase on the concept. And then a question about the current institutions of international law, and Alex, I, you, know, you and I have spoken about this just briefly before, but um, you know, just today, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Kareem Khan, released a statement uh, talking about 42 investigators uh, in Ukraine, uh, talking about cooperation among states, and Florida was talking a little bit about that sort of thing. Um, and also, I thought by the end of that statement, saying, look at, this is why having an international criminal court matters and we can be efficient and effective and we can, we can do good work. So an opportunity for the ICC to, um, to demonstrate its utility and show its stuff. So I guess opportunities uh, uh, for social science and history, opportunities for law, um, Mikola has put that on the table. If people want to respond to that now, we can, or we can turn to questions. 
Right. Okay, so 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 thanks. It's great. It's a great point about about opportunities and. Uh, you know, again, coming from a uh, field of genocide studies, but not being a lawyer. So what we see, so you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. In, in the past, the lawyers were much more willing to the concept than social scientists. Raphael Lemkin was a lawyer by training, and that's where we all come from. But uh, but here we also see, you know, it's like a uh, very interesting dynamic of, you know, trying to work around the concept. So you're right, it's an opportunity to rethink concepts, but but essentially once you have it defined by law and having a UN Convention on Genocide, it's a sort of an analytical straitjacket when it comes to when it comes to definition. So so people who are not lawyers try, you know, twist themselves into a pretzel coming up with with terms that would fit mass violence, but would not use the word genocide because of the various problems. But with the connection here, we actually have, and, and the biggest one is proving, is proving intent, of course, which we need to prove a genocide. And, and here you're right, we, we see a reversal of this data. For example, lawyers, prosecutors think about a standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt. Do other disciplines use a different standard? Prosecutors thinking very much in individual responsibility terms. So Eugene made a reference to you know, rhetoric coming out of Russia. Well, whose rhetoric is that? And are we think are we talk when we talk about genocide, are we say, you know, Russia is committing a genocide, or are we thinking of particular people committing a genocide? So and and is the concept of genocide. Is it defined the same way? Do you think about it in the same terms as lawyers do, or do you think about it in different terms? Um, the, the, the second point about the, that Mikola raised and Ron, you picked up on about, you know, sort of the opportunities here. You know, I really think this, you, you might say, just to sort of put this in a broad perspective, that, you know, there have been certain in, like transformative moments in the field of international criminal law. The first one, obviously, was Nuremberg, which gave birth to the to the you know creation of international criminal law, not of of its enforcement through a tribunal. Um, the second would be certainly the creation of the Yugoslavia Tribunal in 1993. The you know after a 50 year hiatus, a modern tribunal which led to you know a whole series of tribunals for Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and so forth, and then the International Criminal Court. This could be the third kind of transformative moment. Um, we don't know yet because in in two months it could all be done. But uh, you know, but and, and so we won't know until historians later decide. But but it really has the potential of being kind of a third transformative moment of giving this field sort of new energy, like Kareem is talking. You know, Kareem is talking about giving the ICC new life. Um, new, new kind of impetus and focus and energy and commitment by the international community to justice for these crimes. Um, I, you know, one can only hope that that's that 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 is what comes out of these tragic events. Super. So um, I'm going to turn to um, oh, Mikola. Yes, with your permission, thank you very much, Ron. Just, uh, uh, I think on the, on the question of, of, of genocide, uh, I'd like to make three short uh, points. Um, the first uh, is uh, exactly the, the, the issue that has been just uh, erased uh, about the legal definition and, and the non-legal definitions of, uh, of, of genocide. I remember that back in 2014, an excellent colleague, an international criminal lawyer um, from... Um, uh, Central Asia, Sergei Sayapin, has come up with a, with a concept of uh, so, uh, patriocide, uh, describing Russia's efforts to destroy Ukraine as a state, as a nation state. Um, uh, he wasn't sure that genocide was an applicable concept, but he said it's something very similar, so let's pe perhaps find something else. I don't think that it was picked up by many, but at least that was a worthy attempt, uh, which shows that the legal definition is not necessarily um, uh, perfect in each uh, particular case. Uh, secondly, uh, and in continuation of this, 
I think what's already very interesting when we discuss genocide uh, in the um, in the concept of in in the in the in the context of uh, uh, the Russia's war on Ukraine um, is that we are looking at a, at the definition of um, uh, Ukrainians as a national group as opposed to ethnic group and um, and this uh, and uh, I remember how much everyone was frowning on the definition of the national group given by the ICTR in the Akayeso case uh, basically linking it to uh, to, to nationality to or, or even citizenship but uh, um, uh, now I think in this in this concept this this kind of uh, sort of Akayeso definition of, of a national group uh, appears to be the, the most adequate one uh, so it's uh, well, at least this 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 gives it gives a very interesting uh, sort of um, uh, perspective to it. And the third point on genocide is uh, um, exactly what Alex was saying that uh, um, uh, prosecutors are uh, in criminal cases are looking for very concrete things, and certainly lawyers are uh, looking uh, at establishing the 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 the, the, the guilt uh, beyond reasonable uh, doubt. And I would like to um, emphasize on uh, the the. Uh, difference between uh, again state responsibility and individual criminal responsibility. It is easy to say, let's say that um, in inverted commas, Russians or Russia, whatever uh, they, that they commit uh, atrocities, including potentially genocide, perhaps well war crimes, crimes against humanity. But uh, and and this is the, the level of state responsibility, which um, I think is slightly easier to deal with in a way, but then um, uh, bringing it to the level of concrete individuals, individualizing that, uh, it's, it's a very difficult task in the first place. And in the, But secondly, very interestingly, um, when the guilt is individualized, this somehow, uh, in a way, removes uh, the guilt from 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 the collective uh, from the collectivity. So that that's something that needs to uh, needs to be borne in mind as well. And in a way, effective international criminal justice with very uh, concrete individuals being held accountable is a way to sort of normalizing potentially things after uh, after the war. Uh, and this is something that the concept of genocide has always been found problematic with, you know, because because the the, the, the accusation has always been that the concept of genocide uh, makes uh, um, uh, whole nations hostile to each other if one keeps insisting on them destroying us and and, and so on. So, so these these I think are factors that need to also to be to be taken into account. Thank you very much, Ron. Super. I'm going to um, turn to Monica, but I just want to uh, just inject one thing. And I I hesitated to do this earlier because, as Eugene says. Um, we ought not think of all these definitions as law first, but in recognition of some in the audience who may not, uh, and this is coming through a bit in Q&A, know these concepts. Let me just do the quick 30 second before I turn to Monica. Um, if you think about, uh, I mean, Alex has discussed the crime of aggression. Uh, this is the invasion of one sovereign state by another without legal justification. Think of that in the most generic terms. Um, war crimes are crimes that happen in the conduct of the war, right? So sexual assault by a soldier in war, uh, right? So you have a gamut of things that can occur as war crimes. Uh, these are crimes that happen uh, that violate the rules of war. Think of it in those terms. Um, uh, Crimes against humanity uh, would be crimes that occur against a civilian population, which could also be a war crime. But if it's widespread and systematic, a policy, let's say, of widespread sexual violence uh, can amount to a crime against humanity as well as being a war crime at the level of the individual soldier. Uh, and then genocide, which we've been having this debate uh, or discussion around what its definition might be in the strictest of legal terms, and Eugene put the question of intention in, is the intention to destroy a group, but not all groups, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group at the international level. There are other definitions elsewhere, but Mikola was talking about a national group. So the intention to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in whole or in part, as such, in, in, its, in its capacity as a group, as opposed to its capacity, its, place in a territory or something else. And so there's a lot of uh, ambiguity around those statements, but that's the sort of set of concepts. And um, Monica, I'll turn to you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody in the audience could be on the same page of what we were fighting about when we fought about the legal versus political and social definitions. 
Great. And just on the matter of the social definitions, in addition to uh, working in law and being a legal scholar, I'm also an anthropologist. And I'm so grateful that uh, for McCullough's participation today, I just wanted to add, um, as we collectively are thinking about terms like genocide in their plural sense going forward, that we really pay attention to um, Ukrainians' experience, uh, Ukrainians' reporting of their own experience. Um, there may be things that do not meet uh, legal proofs that are deeply meaningful to Ukrainians. So being erased from history books, um, having uh, language forbidden, um, having specific, as is happening in the current aggression, having specific local museums targeted for artillery shelling, shelling that have to do with local folk artists or that have to do with Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine's historic um, philo philosophical figures and contributions. Um, those are the targeting of, of for artillery shelling of empty buildings that are, um, that have significance. These, the people who are the objects of erasure, we need to pay attention to their voices about what's significant to them. So that's all I wanted to plead for is a, a listening to Ukrainians about what's going on in Ukraine and what's significant to them. Super. Thank you. So let's let's start turning to the audience. I think people people deserve to be able to ask their questions. And so. Um, it's interesting. Some of the some of the questions are quite specific legally, so we'll see who who decides to jump in on them. Uh, but one question is really about self defense and whether or not Ukraine has submitted a, a letter or made a declaration that what it is doing is acting in self defense against Russian aggression, and whether that would change anything, uh, and or uh, whether the U.S. Other countries uh, might themselves submit letters saying that they're providing assistance to Ukraine as a result of said self-defense. So really uh, turning this to a question about Ukraine's position regarding self-defense and the legal ramifications, whether that's an interesting strategy, what the legal ramifications of such a strategy would be for Ukraine as well as for third parties. I don't want to call on anyone, but people can just unmute as they wish. <laughs> Mikola. Okay, yes, I, I, uh, sure. Uh, th th thanks, Rana. It's a, it's a, it's a, Self-defense is certainly one of the key concepts here, and this is actually, um, self-defense is one of the, one of the things, uh, uh, one of the short answers why, uh, you know, to the question why international law is relevant at all. In the circumstances, exactly because uh, um, Ukraine certainly has a right to um, inherent right to individual and collective self-defense. Now, on the formalistic part of the of, of the of the of, of the question, um, Ukraine has certainly um, explained uh, in in a, in a great detail what uh, it has been engaged uh, in or or faced with uh, since the twenty fourth of. Uh, um, February this year, and actually the, uh, the, the large-scale invasion of the Russian Federation was uh, launched whilst uh, the Security Council was in session um, uh, in New York, and uh, those who watched it might, uh, might recall how the Ukrainian ambassador was asking the Russian ambassador to dial his foreign minister and to find out what was happening um, and, and to, to explain it to the, to the Security Council straight away. And the answer was, of course, that, that the Russian ambassador wasn't going to wake up his foreign minister for for such a uh, you know small thing. So um, uh, the, the, all the necessary declarations have been made, and uh, the uh, the, the uh, Security Council resolutions was uh, tabled and it was vetoed by the Russian Federation. So uh, uh, there's uh, this 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 is it. End of story for the Security Council. And this is exactly why uh, the extraordinary session of the United Nations General Assembly was was called and and uh, it was the UN body that qualified Russia's actions as as aggression against Ukraine by 141 um, uh, vote. So in a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, this is it. I don't think that state that states providing assistance to Ukraine need to make any declarations to that effect. Uh, the, none of their participation actually qualifies as participation in collective self-defense. Uh, uh, any UN member state, uh, any state, in fact, uh, has a perfect right to join Ukraine in defending Ukraine, to 
you know, in, in a collective self-defense effort. None has done so. But of course, many uh, states have provided Ukraine with uh, extremely important and valuable uh, assistance. So that's that, that would be the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mikola. Uh, the next question uh, that I have on my list actually uh, really responds. I think, Alex, you mentioned the Yugoslavia Tribunal, uh, picks up on that uh, and picks up on the the feints and ruses and attempts there were uh, in the ICTY uh, to be able to obtain, um, get your hands on quite literally, individuals, whether that was you know, tricks and feints to sell people property that wasn't there, whether they were attempts to kidnap people and take them out, right? And so the question is really, since higher ups, as the uh, participant asks, aren't going to surrender themselves to the ICC, and since they aren't going to themselves leave Russia, uh, what are the other options, right? Um, is there an opportunity here to, uh, by force, by feint, by ruse, by trickery, or by deceit, uh, get people out uh, in order to be able to prosecute them um, with your hands on them? Alex. Yeah, so the answer to that question is yes, is probably yes, but. Um, so the, as a, from a legal, uh, as a legal question, criminal courts usually don't care how the accused arrived in the courtroom. Um, and so if they arrive by a trick or by force or they were kidnapped, but that typically courts, unless there's some really gross violation of, you know, of human rights, the courts will accept that, uh, will, will, will take jurisdiction of, over that person. So that does uh, open up the possibility suggested in the question that somebody could be, you know, forcibly brought to The Hague. As a political matter, I think it's um, that, at least in right now, that scenario is a little hard to imagine. It's that I think countries would be reluctant to go into Russia and couldn't start, you know, seizing people and bringing them. It creates precedents that could be difficult to manage in the future. Um, however, it, this question sort of uh, raises a larger question, which is, well, you know, we're, we're, there there is possibility here for, you know, there are all these investigations, there's all this energy, as you said, there are 42 investigators from the ICC going to, you know, going on the ground. Um, where does it all lead? And how are we going to get accused into the courtroom? And that is a hard question. That's a hard question. Uh, and I think that there are there are possibilities other than the ones suggested in the question. Um, some people, some defendants will be seized on the will be captured on the battlefield. That's already happened. Um, there may be some defendants who choose to travel in the future and are arrested. Uh, and then I think the 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 you know the most you know well I, I'm not going to say anything's more realistic than the other, but but there is also the possibility that in, sometime in the future there is a change in regime which allows for accused persons to be surrendered. I, I'm not going to say that's likely, but that's another possibility. Um, but, but these are but these are hard questions of, and with no easy answers, um, and they're probably not questions that will be addressed in the in the you know coming months, but further in the future. So, so thank you, Alex. And I see Eugene um, has been able to get back in. So uh, a question that I have for the whole panel. So I'm happy Eugene is here. Um, really picks up on you know one of the questions that's being asked in the chat about we might think of them as ordinary Russians. Uh, what ordinary Russians think about the situation, what ordinary Russians think about the invasion, what ordinary Russians think about Ukraine, what ordinary Russians think about Ukraine as a nation. Uh, and so these are obviously questions that are social and political, but are also deeply uh, legal uh, in the ways we just talked about. Um, so I wanna think about that and attach it, that's the question, but think about that and attach it to what Mikola raised around individual and collective responsibility. And so uh, one way to think about this is, you know, a question that um, certainly I was uh, focused on last week when uh, Emmanuel Macron made a claim that we ought not humiliate Russia. And at least as I read the statement, or at least it may not be useful to humiliate Russia. Um, as I read the statement, uh, he doesn't name Putin in the statement, at least in the version I've read. And so the question about 
Um, what it means to not humiliate Russia or the utility in not humiliating Russia um, raises the question here, I think, of how to think about Russians, how to think about Russian leaders, how to think about military leaders, how to think about Putin, and to think about these in different categories, potentially. So maybe that's too far um, a way to think about this, but the question really is, how do we think about the collective question of Russians, collective responsibility versus individual responsibility, and maybe the Macron statement is a way to think about that. I don't know. That's my own intervention there. But um, Monica, Eugene, Nicola, Alex, I don't mean to exclude you, but you're, you're on the last one. So I'll, I'll respond to at least part of that. Um, the, um, the Macron statement that you referenced, so Emmanuel Macron's uh, statement that it's important not to humiliate Russia. I read that, and perhaps wrongly, but I read that as aimed in part to, um, obviously, a Ukrainian audience, in part to the international community, which is pretty nebulous, in, in large part to Macron's once and future friends and partners in Russia itself. And um, I also read that as potentially a direct response to the US uh, Secretary of Defense, who in a visit to Ukraine within the last week or week and a half time, I don't know about for anybody else, but my sense of time is like an accordion these days. <laughs> and there might be something that happened four days ago that I think happened three weeks ago because so much happens every day. But in any case, so sometime, let's say within the last two weeks, but it might've been like five days ago, um, the US Secretary of Defense was in Kyiv and he stated openly at a press conference that it was important in the conflict in Ukraine that uh, Russian military forces be degraded to the point such that they do not in the future pose a threat to the security of Russia's neighbors. And um, so I read Macron's statement as potentially a response to the American statement. And, and I'd have to say that I felt like the US Secretary of Defense said something out loud that maybe is may or may not be the US policy, may or may not be a wise policy, but I don't think it's wise to say out loud. I don't think that it, I, I, and in that respect, I, I, I don't think it lessens the feeling of victimhood or the feeling of if one is already isolated, then one has nothing left to lose. I don't think it reduces that sentiment uh, with Russian elites or with the military or with the public. Um, about the um, what do Russians think, um, I, as an anthropologist, I avoid generalizations without data, but I will say that... Um, we can think about the collective Putin, who seems to be getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> and we can think about Russian elites, we can think about the Russian military, and especially the military command is also getting smaller and smaller um, through battlefield attrition in Ukraine, uh, kind of unprecedented numbers. Um, but we can also think about um, the Russian, the, the population of the citizenship of the Russian Federation versus the guys who are actually being sent to fight in Ukraine. The guys on the ground, there's, there's two um, sort of famous units that are famous for their brutality and for their not following the rules of law, and that is the Kadyrov forces and the private military contracting group called the Wagner Group that uh, Putin had been sending to places like Syria or places like Central African Republic, and they have a lot of experience in dirty work. And it was alarming to many of us watching when we saw those two units, the Wagner Group and the Kadyrov forces being sent to Ukraine, because that feels like a specific, um, that's a specific tool for specific ends. And those ends are never pretty. They're always uglier than one can imagine. Um, but if we accept those two groups, if we take those two groups out of the occasion, most of the uh, most of the forces killed in the Russian forces killed in Ukraine, um, according to information released yesterday, um, a study released, released yesterday, most of those guys are coming from Buryatia, which is, I, I rode from Buryatia on the train to Kiev once, and it took me five days. So it is very far, very far from Ukraine. It's on the other side of Lake Baikal in Siberia, and they do not self-identify as ethnic Russian. 
and they are by tradition um, Buddhist and they're Russian is their second language. Um, so those guys are fighting and dying in disproportionate numbers in Ukraine. Likewise, uh, people from Northern Ossetia, which is a part of Russia in the Northern Caucasus mountains. So if we think about what do Russians think, if uh, ethnic Russians, uh, urban uh, Russian citizens are not the same as the people who are being sent to die in Ukraine. Anyone else? Mikola. Yes, um, thank you very much. Just very briefly, I, I, I'd like to second what M Monica has said concerning generalizations and what Russians uh, think. And uh, uh, one, uh, one doesn't have any, any credible data as to what Russians actually think to begin with. And, and, and secondly, what Russians will think after the aggressive mm. war propaganda stops on their TV uh, is, is, is a totally different matter. So in that, in that respect, I think this is... Uh, not uh, uh, not much uh, not much of a problem. So let me let me stop here because certainly there's also a legalistic part to um, Macron's question. Perhaps you can just just uh, just the legal, legal, legalistic answer is that I when it, when when I read this stuff about humiliation, I immediately recalled, of course, as uh, as a lawyer. Um, uh, the, uh, your, uh, the uh, articles on state responsibility for internationally wrongful acts, Article 37, which uh, which talks about satisfaction. Satisfaction is uh, um, uh, the uh, moral, so to say, or political responsibility for the injury caused by the act insofar as it cannot be made good by restitution or compensation. And uh, satisfaction is acknowledgement of the breach, expression of regret, formal apology, or other appropriate modality. But the funny thing is that um, uh, uh, the, uh, the last paragraph of, of that article says that satisfaction shall not be out of proportion to the injury and may not take a form humiliating to the responsible state. So I think uh, I, I'd rather stick to the legalistic uh, approach uh, in assessing Macron's uh, words rather than uh, uh, starting a big discourse about uh, what's going on in his mind. Thank you very much. Over, over to you, Ron. And I'll turn right over to Eugene. Thank you. I apologize for disappearing earlier. The power here jumped, so I was out for a couple of minutes. Now, so on Macron's, I actually don't know what not humiliating Russia actually means, but as a counterpoint, my wonderful colleague, Sergei Rachenko, who is a Russian citizen and very anti-war and anti-Putin, wrote an op-ed, I think, two days ago in The Spectator, arguing that Russia needs to be humiliated because that's the only way to get Russia and Russians out of the imperial, out of the imperial mindset and try to start something new. So I encourage everyone to read it. It's, it's a wonderful, very powerful op-ed. As for, you know, as Russians think, well, obviously we don't really know, and I could agree with Monica that we don't have any reliable data on what they think. And Honestly, I don't think it matters what they think because we need to distinguish between two things. First is the indivi individual guilt, and that's where what Monica was talking about, you know, the individual soldiers from Buryatia, from South Ossetia, whoever they are, whoever they come from, that's on them, and then it will be for lawyers and for the courts to decide to do with them. But the bigger issue is not collective guilt, but collective responsibility. If the Russian state that an agent of Russian state who kills citizens in Ukraine and everyone who happens to be Russian citizen shares a responsibility, not an individual guilt, but as a responsibility for what the state doing regardless whether they like it or not. And that's the important distinction that we need to make, not talk about collective guilt, but collective responsibility. Because once we start shifting to the guilt point, and I'll, and I'll already see it in a couple of years, intellectuals and the intelligence in places like Moscow, St. Petersburg, etc., will start telling us, well, you know what, those are those uneducated, poor, non-Russian Burets or Ossetians or Chechens who did this. We have nothing to do with that. And that will get them off the hook in terms of responsibility. Again, not guilt, but responsibility. And I think we need to avoid that at any cost. May I respond also? Of course, Monica, yeah. So, um, Mikola and Eugene, you've given me food for thought. And Mikola, you're you're linking the term humiliation to the legal term satisfaction, and that satisfaction should not be out of proportion. Um, that uh, 
that rang or that resonated for me in terms of timing um in within ukraine there has been a call for um part of the negotiation the negotiated settlement of the hostilities to include uh the russian government paying the cost of rebuilding ukraine that the first person that I heard say this, I'm sure it's happened in a lot of places. The first person that I heard say this is the um, journalist and uh, social commentator Olga Lien, um, who said, here's my conditions. We denazify Russia <laughs> and Russia pays the costs of our, of our rebuilding. Um, and then uh, May 17th, which I, I don't, I guess that's today. Is that today? <laughs> Um, so May 17th, it was yesterday in Ukraine. <laughs> so May 17th, the uh, the Rada, the Parliament of Ukraine, um, introduced um, a bill on um, on the repaying the costs or re or satisfying the harms of the war that were caused by Russian aggression in Ukraine. And so that gets directly to Mikola's point about a uh, proportionate satisfaction. Um, and um, I shudder to think for the future of the Russian budget, if they actually had to pay in proportion to the harm that they're causing just in physical terms. Um, but, but that could be the conversation that is brewing that, Mar that Macron has inserted himself into, is this question of um, actual financial accountability in, in addition to criminal or civil liability for war crimes, um, financial accountability, who is going to actually pay to clean up this mess? It's also a question of law and legal strategy too. So I think, so that's, I think it's so important, Monica, for us to think uh, laterally across these issues. So that's great. Um, I actually have a question that comes from the audience for Alex. Um, uh, Alex, I'll, I'll backfill this with uh, a statement you'll remember uh, probably better than I will, uh, from the British Prime Minister talking about Assad, saying that um, while he couldn't have a place in, in the UK, surely there'd be a way to get him out uh, and he could live a life uh, outside of prosecution. And so this has come to be known as uh, in law as the peace justice trade-off. Uh, you can think of it as a tussling between diplomats and lawyers, however you want to think about that. But the question from the audience is precisely this. Um, could there be a ceasefire that came with immunity, could the ICC, uh, I'll add, would the ICC uh, be willing to uh, to engage in such a kind of immunity enterprise? Uh, and would such a thing have any legal status? So I raised the, the UK and Assad point as a way to frame the debate, but um, the question is about that specifically. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer the specific question and then and then try to sort of step back and give the, a, a, talk for a moment about the bigger picture, the bigger debate. So the specific question is no, the court would not and would not engage in a kind of immunity deal or peace pro that that's not the role of the court. And it, it it's it's not able to do that and it won't do that. Um, it, its job is to investigate and prosecute um, you know, perpetrators of these crimes, bring cases when there is sufficient evidence and prosecute them diligently when it has jurisdiction. Um, it, it doesn't engage in making decisions. Of, it, it doesn't have the authority, um, legal authority to, you know, grant immunity and engage in those sorts of discussions. Now, however, the, the court is situated, situated in a political world where those questions and those debates are, are often active um, and this was a big debate, in particular, at the beginning of the International Criminal Court. There was a lot of discussion about that, a lot of articles written, a lot of thought about it. And, uh, you know, does, does justice give way to peace? Does peace give it, uh, you know, do you have to choose? And I, I think ultimately um, the, where the debate landed is that you, 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 you choose both, right? You, you kind of need to have both. Um, there may be obviously uh, difficult choices at the margins that the court doesn't make, but that political actors um, uh, make. But what, what, from my experience and what, what, what I have seen is that when the court insists on its mandate and when others support it, diplomats adjust. 
to that reality. That becomes a reality, a new reality that the diplomats contend with. Um, you know, and, and, and so it's not, the courts should not themselves go down that road of betting against, bargaining against themselves. They should focus on their mission and insist on their mission. And then um, the diplomats will adjust to that, to, to the fact that, that justice is required in these situations. That doesn't mean that the justice is always, I mean, that the diplomats always deliver, um, but they often, often find a way to get to peace um, without compromising, you know, completely compromising the justice project. Super, I don't know if others uh, want to add in, but um, maybe we can go to a, a different but related question, which has to do with uh, local capacity on the, on the ground and in law, right? So um, I don't remember who it was. It may have been Alex. It may have been Monica, who was discussing uh, you know, current uh, prosecutions that happen in local trials or prosecutions that can happen or may happen uh, in local settings. And there's a question from the audience about... Um, Functionality, capacity, technical expertise, uh, and and uh, political constraints, perhaps, on such local courts. Uh, so to put differently, uh, if you have international courts, maybe one of the reasons uh, has something to do with the, the challenge of doing such things on the ground. Um, the pendulum also has swung, swung the other way sometimes to say local justice may be better. Um, and so uh, I'll turn to anyone who wants to answer that. I don't have someone in mind. Nicola. Yes, uh, thanks. I, I kind of feel, thank you, thank you, Ron. I kind of feel obliged as, a, as, as, as the only Ukrainian lawyer here. Um, the, the Ukrainian uh, legal system is, uh, is a rather typical European legal system. It is uh, open to, to external scrutiny, including by the European Court of, of Human Rights. Uh, it has received lots of uh, help and advice internationally for, uh, of, of, of recent years. Uh, it is obvious that the war has uh, significantly impacted the uh, capacity, and, and this is this is only natural. What what else could could, could one expect? However, um, international criminal law and the international criminal court uh, is is essentially based on the principle of complementarity and the presumption is that the bulk of the work must be done at the, at the national level at the domestic level um uh, so it is a question of uh, uh, what defi uh, fi of uh, determining what uh, uh, what is the extent of support the ukrainian domestic uh, system actually requires to uh, to do its job the 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 legislation is there the institutions are there uh, the expertise uh, certainly leaves something to be desired so uh, of course especially when it comes to such complicated matters as, as war crimes crimes against humanity and the crime of genocide uh, and, and potentially the crime of aggression these are things which where uh, an inter international support uh, is most welcome in my in my view but uh, this this will have to be um, coordinated between ukraine's uh, authorities and 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 the the international community those who are there willing and able uh, to to assist but there's no other alternative whatever no matter how active the international criminal court is going to be uh, it is not going to uh, to do to do the to do the actual um, job except for a very small percent of, of of cases which would of course be very important for international criminal justice and for international law and for ukraine but uh, um, but that that's essentially it. And speaking of external scrutiny, let's not forget that Ukraine, as Ukraine has consented to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, it means that it will be the ICC which will uh, have to uh, check how genuine the the prosecutions are at the domestic level. So that's uh, in addition to the existing mechanisms of of the European Court of Human Rights and and, and so forth. So the, the the national system is there. It has to be uh, assessed, evaluated, and supported. Thank you. Thank you, Mikola. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're nearing the very end. We have about five minutes left. We have four panelists other than myself. And so what I thought I might do is give everybody a chance to, you know, say 30 seconds, a minute uh, of concluding thoughts. Um, motivating question, if you want one. Uh, mine would be, uh, what a strange world that, we're, that we talk about law in this context. And um, this is not... Uh, 
I don't, you know, in what, in what world is this the world, right? In what world is the question of uh, an invasion of Ukraine um, thought about as a question of law and legal strategy at the back end? And uh, maybe that's one way to think about this. Uh, Eugene, I know you raised questions uh, about that to begin. And so maybe it's a good way to, to end it uh, is to give everyone 30 seconds to a minute to think uh, about that in the sense, what are we doing here? Uh, the four of us, the five of us, and maybe Eugene, I'll start with you. Thanks, Ron. So what kind of world it is? Well, it's our world, of course, and it's a crazy world. And I'm with morning on, you know, time being a sort of accordion, because what we're witnessing is a history on steroids, essentially, and, you know, things that would take generations now unfolding in front of the days. It's obviously, you know, horrible to process for everyone. You know. I mean, I was born in Ukraine, I grew up in Lviv, so for me it's also very, very personal, but it is also, I think, an opportunity to build something better with, you know, within legal frameworks, within other frameworks, and that's probably the only hope that we have, that after Ukraine wins this war, we'll build something better. I guess I'll, I'll call people out. I apologize. I yeah. should have made that clear. Thank you, Eugene, Alex, mm -hmm. then Monica, then Nikola. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, if you work in the field of international law, you constantly confront the question of, you know, well, well, is it really law and what does it do and, and so forth? And I, and I think what we've seen in the last months is the, the importance and in some cases, the power of international law. And, uh, you know, in, in international law has has sort of been the underpinning, the architecture, the structure that has supported, um, you know, the Ukrainians in their acts, their fighting and self defense. Uh, obviously, they have an existential interest there, but but that but it's given legal support for that, um, and legal support for the worldwide reaction, which has been extraordinary uh, in terms of sanctions, in terms of support. That's all, you know, justified and constructed on a edifice, on a on an architecture of law, um, and that's what that's what gives it its its authority, its justification, um, and its you know its sort of power. So this has been a for me for me I think a, an important moment for international law. Monica, um, so um, I follow that by saying. Uh, the war that started in 2014, the invasion of 2022 is the full scale um, expansion of the war that started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the beginning of the war in southeastern Ukraine. Um, uh, that war was crafted by a person who has a law degree. Vladimir Putin is legally trained. And you could see the rhetoric before the preponing the the referendum in Crimea. To he was preponing legal arguments, the right of a people to self determination, to try to counter um, a a charge of of uh, annexation or territorial um, uh, a violation of territorial territorial integrity. Um, likewise, with the rhetoric about genocide against the Ukrainian government in the months leading up to the invasion of February, 2022. Um, these are, le legal training is informing the rhetoric and sometimes the practice of this war. And now on the Ukrainian side, we have Zelensky who is also legally trained. And in both his presidency and also previously in his uh, work as a businessman, producer and comedian, you can see his legal mind working. So law has a place in the leadership levels. Um, it also informs our, uh, the, on the level of the public, it informs our perceptions and our experiences of uh, what peace means and what justice means and what a justice motive um, might be driving at. Um, and what kind of world are we living in? Since Ukraine has become the lightning rod for this crime of aggression, we are living in a world filled with innovative, creative people who are really th uh, thinking smart and nimbling on their feet. If this is a justice moment, as Alex said at the beginning, it's a justice moment that has the energy behind it of a really, a, a population that is steeped in open-endedness, 
So we have an open-ended world that can go either way. And that depends on us. Yes, thank you. I, I think my distinguished co-panelists have um, uh, answered your question so well that I can only subscribe to what they've, they've said. And perhaps to say that indeed, uh, we all knew that international law um, uh, lacked uh, efficiency in many respects and the rather uh, unsatisfactory reaction to the 2014 aggression against Ukraine has finally uh, well, um, led to the situation that we are facing uh, now. But perhaps this is indeed the moment of opportunity to make this world better, because after all, international law has always been the project of making this world better. So I hope this project succeeds finally. Thank you very much. Super. Well, thank you to everyone here. Thank you, Alex, Eugene, Monica, Nicola. Thank you to everybody in the audience. We've we've come to time. And so uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming uh, virtually uh, as it is today. Uh, and on behalf of the Petro Yashik Program for the Study of Ukraine, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies and the Monk School, uh, as well as St. Louis University School of Law, where Monica hails from, uh, thank you to everybody for joining us today for, I think, uh, both an engaging but also deeply important uh, conversation about the role of law in today's uh, in the invasion of Ukraine. So thank you everybody. <laughs>